Welcome to this month's Insights interview from the Payments Association. I'm Tony Craddock, Director General, and our VIP guest this month is one of industry's leaders. He's at the helm of one of the most important companies, a global bank. He's also a champion for change in preventing fraud, of educating young people to equip them for the world of work, ensuring we have a diverse industry in every respect. So to find out about his background, uh, what we should do to solve the problems facing our sector and what he thinks is coming our way in 2023, please welcome the CEO of Santander UK, Mike Rainier. Thank you, Tony. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. So, Mike, at the start of each Insights interview, in fact, I sometimes refer to them as a fireside chat. In fact, you did notice earlier, I do indeed have a fire. In have a fire, yeah. Which is wonderful. I asked my VIP, VIP guest how they, how they stay motivated and really what makes them go the extra mile when they're faced with balancing challenging jobs and, and, and home lives. So, you know, this is really relevant to you. You're responsible for a UK operation of a, of a bank that employs 19,000 people as part of one of Europe's largest banks and so 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 what Mike is it that continues to motivate you? I think it's actually I mean it's a great question Tony it's actually very easy to remain motivated when you you have the privilege of uh, doing a job like the one that that I do I mean the, the role I think the really important thing for me is actually just coming back to the role that banks play I mean ultimately banks are here to help people save for the future they're here to help facilitate uh, payments, which I'm sure will be the focus of the conversation today. They're here to lend money to people so that they can buy things that matter. And they're here to help people and businesses ensure and protect the things that really matter to them to help you know, have the best future that they possibly can. So actually, the role that we play is a really important part of why I'm massively motivated to do the job that I do, because that's a you know huge responsibility and a, and a massive honor. Mm, yeah, I can see how it's inspiring. And, and it's, people like you often have a um, a North Star, don't they, that kind of helps them guide them on their way. You know, what would you say are your guiding principles that have helped you? That's a really good question. And I'm sure these things will be different for everybody. There, there have always been a number of things that have motivated me and guided me through the career. Well, actually, your family life as well. And probably the most important one to start with is I've always put my family first. That is the most important thing to me. Um, one of the decisions that uh, my wife and I made 20 odd years ago now was that we didn't want to uh, base ourselves in central London. Uh, and that's why we decided 20 years ago to move north to Yorkshire, where uh, we've raised our children and where I still live with uh, my wife and family. And actually getting the compromise and the challenge and the balance right between the amount of time that you, you spend at home and the amount of time that you spend uh, working um, is a really important one. And I've always thought that if you're going to spend, you know, upwards of realistically 12, 13 hours plus a day working, you've got to do something that really, uh, really excites you, that you're passionate about, where you really enjoy what you're doing. Yes, and yes. then you've got to get the balance right. I say that's one of the most important things for me. And I guess the other thing that's always motivated me is just an inherent drive to try and do the best job I possibly can. Mm. Yeah, I'm sure that resonates with lots of listeners too. I find this industry is full of very committed and passionate people who yeah. are trying to do the best they can. Mm. So you've you've had a fascinating career. You know, you studied um, engineering and economics and management yeah. at Oxford. You got an MBA in NCAD and and then you worked as a as a consultant, Arthur D. Little, and and then at one of our members, Boston Consulting Group, for a few years. And then you moved on to ASDA to become the general manager um, for it turns out beers, wines, and spirits, which I yeah, thought was a tough job that one. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure you have a lot of people going. Ah, oh, yeah, good good preparation for your <laughs> hands up if you bought a billion pounds of booze in your life. I'm afraid to say, my word, that, yeah. that's <laughs> a billion pounds. That's, that's a fair heap. So so what was there anything in your in your childhood or your early career that, that prepared you to, to become a leader of this sort of organisation, would you say? Um, that's a really good question. And I've reflected on that a little bit, actually, in preparing for this conversation today. I'm not sure there really is, actually. When I was younger, I, again, I just one of the things I mentioned earlier, I always wanted to do the best job I could. I was probably one of these insecure, overachieving kind of people mm. uh, when, I was, when I was younger. And I was also quite competitive, which isn't a particularly attractive trait. And, and over time, you kind of learn that even though you might be inherently driven and really want to achieve and do the best you can, which is one of the things I've also mentioned, 
I'm not sure there was anything particularly that that happened when I was young or anything other than just what you're born with and how you're raised and what what um I guess what values you you have when you're when you're being brought up that really drive and motivate you and I've certainly found that that's been something that's driven with driven me and stuck with me my entire career. So that's fascinating. So you weren't sort of captain of the first 15 and captain of this and captain of that. You didn't kind of clearly, but your mum and dad must have had an idea. Well, I, did, I did do some of that. And I'm, I'm not as accomplished a rugby player as you are, Tony, but, um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, but uh, yes, I mean, I used, to, I used to do that kind of thing. And at school, I was, you know, head of house and captain of this and the other. And yeah. th- those things give you the experience that, that you need. But I think more important than anything is, is learning that, you know, humility is a really important part of being a really good leader as well. And and that is just something you have to remember too. Yes, values led. I remember Richard Branson teaching me that many years ago, be values led and, and everything else follows. Um, mm. So, okay, very good. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about the payments industry. Now they say that you know, payments is a, is a represents a, a, you know, 40% or so of global banking revenues. Um, uh, we think it's everything. Of course, it's not everything. It's only a part of what the bank does. Um, it's developed over the years in a, an extraordinary way. Nobody would have invented the payment system as it is now, but it is as it is. It's secure, it's low cost, and it really helps people pay and get paid um, securely, qu- quickly and cheaply. And, um, you know, but it's only one part of, of banking. Um, yeah. And it very much used to be seen as a poor relation, I'd say. Um, do you think Do you think this is still the case in payments? Do you think we're still the kind of the, the, the paupers? I think well, I, I definitely don't think that's the case anymore. It probably it probably was true um, looking back years ago. I remember when I was at the Boston Consulting Group, which you mentioned as one of your members um, earlier, Tony. We used to publish this. In fact, we still publish a global payments report. Back in the day, um, this was twenty years ago when it was first being published. It was a partner in London called Nick Viner, who yeah. I think has since retired from consulting. But I remember um, him working tirelessly on this global payments report, and he wasn't quite sure how many people with a couple of his colleagues in other offices would actually read or be interested in what um, uh, this consulting firm had to say about payments. But nowadays, it's, I think, one of the most successful flagship reports that the firm publishes because the importance of payments in terms of that being the thing that sits right at the heart of the main of a customer's relationship with a bank has really exploded. And, you know, you're right, 20 years ago, what was most important was banks making really good credit decisions. So deciding who to lend to, how much to lend to, how much capital was required to put behind it, and making sure that you manage the balance sheet in a a prudent way. Now that's obviously still right at the heart of what banking is, but what's become much more important, which is where we've seen masses of competition and loads of innovation. And you've mentioned a few of the kind of payment schemes that have risen to the fore since then, which you're right, do provide really cheap, low cost, quick, easy, flexible, uh, multifaceted payment mechanisms and there's plenty more innovation to come I'm sure mm. uh, to customers and clients right around the world um, that's just become so much more important and I, I think if you take a big step step back from the whole thing in, in banking I mean people talk to, about the relationship they had with the bank being with their bank account right the bank account what is a bank account well it's really just a collection of payment mechanisms that's all it is that's all it's ever been actually mm. Uh, yeah. And years ago, it would have been checks and cash and gyros. And now it's faster payments and mobile banking and uh, Apple Pay or Google Pay or whatever it is that people want to do or faster yeah. payments. It's, it's just totally changed in the technologies. But the underlying uh, thing of this relationship that customers have with a bank being a collection of payments is still very much the case, but it's much more important now. So if if it is, has become more important, and that perhaps is behind the changing perceptions of 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 um of of, of, of our industry, you know, how, what does that actually mean? Do you think for for people who are leading companies, or if they, if they are in payments themselves, or as a perhaps as a colleagues of yours, such as Paul Horlock, who's a your chief payment officer, he's a yes. um, a member of our advisory board. You know, people who are leading the change internally. What do you think it means for them? this new status of our industry? Well, it's, I mean, pay, payments really do sit right at the heart of the customer relationship with and the client relationship, irrespective of whether it's a personal or a business relationship with, with the bank. And banks are all about trust, aren't they? That's what banks are here for, is mm-hmm. people trust us with their money and regulators trust us to, to make sure that we continue to operate in a prudent manner so that we look after that money and so that we look after our balance sheets for our shareholders and for the for the nation because ultimately 
uh, banks, you know, too big to bear, really. So we've got to make sure we're doing everything in the right way. And people like Paul Horlock here at uh, Santander and colleagues of his right across the industry, they play a really important role because payments basically are the, the gateway to, to value for a lot of customers day in, day out. We all make payments every day and we just assume that things are going to happen and go through in a completely seamless way. Um, but we've got to make sure that we retain the security, but we also have to make sure that we're continuing to innovate so that customers can benefit from the new technologies and the new ways of working that are emerging. And I mean, the single biggest thing that's changed over the past 15 years is the invention of the smartphone, as we know. Yes. yes. And with that has become an explosion in the way that payments have, have changed and transitioned as well. I mean, it started off with a contactless card, and then before you know it, the contactless card was on the phone. And then, you know, nowadays it's wearables. It, you know, people just assume that however they can make payments will be available to them. Yes. And we've seen some payments going the other way as well. So obviously the, the announcement last year that PayM was going to be closing. Personally, I think that's a that's a real shame. As a as a you know, as a customer, I used to use that regularly, uh, standing by the football pitch in particular, trying to get money out of people to buy. You know, Christmas gifts for the coaches. Payment was really handy. Yes, you yes. needed to have with someone's mobile phone, their mobile banking app, and your phone yeah, number, absolutely. and uh, you could, you know, collect money from people and go off and and buy stuff. But obviously, there there are other mechanisms now that will replace that. But this, I, I guess, this birth and death of different payment mechanisms is absolutely part of any system, and, and it's, it's to be and, the case. And you know, it's so hard to know which ones to back. Yeah, it really is. You I know. Think I, Honestly, I, I look at PayPal and I think, how can that be such a an, an important part of the e-commerce experience? It keeps on popping up. I never use it, I must say. But, but you know, I wouldn't have predicted that. But equally, um, uh, you know, some of the, as you say, PayM and there's others that are no longer here that I kind of feel they should have been. But goodness me. Yeah. Uh, so part, part of that is I think it, it's important to, with these new payment schemes. You talk about PayPal is a really good example. I mean, PayPal got to where it got to because of the link with eBay. Um, and effectively, with, with many of these things, it's not the first into the market with these schemes. It's the first to get to scale uh, in the market. And PayPal got to scale. And as a result of that, it's benefited for a long time uh, on the back of that. So we're looking ahead now. It's uh, early 2023. Um, you know, what are the things you know, in light, you, you're, what are the things you're looking forward to in the year ahead for which the industry needs to be ready or wary, would you say? And I think 2023 is going to be a a challenging year obviously in the UK we're looking at what could potentially be a recessionary environment we've got the cost of living challenges that all of us are facing day to day and our employees and colleagues in in the banks and organizations that we work in are all facing this in a very real way day in day out but we're also in a world where there's there's lots of change coming in the in the regulatory space in the payment space in the banking space with fintechs and others and the investor environment has changed a lot as well. So for, mm -hmm. I guess, for a number of your members who are uh, fintechs or, uh, you know, payment tech companies, the environment in terms of the investor space has changed completely in the past 12, 18 months. And so I guess for them, the challenges again will be quite different. So th there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff to look forward to, I think, this year, but it's going to be a very challenging year. And I don't think there's any question about that. Yeah, so we're also seeing a lot of... Uh... A lot of interest from the regulators as to what we think about certain things. The new payment yeah. services regulation review has just been launched, essentially, with a couple of exceptions. It's tell us what you think our regulation should be in the UK. Yeah. I mean, that's a huge uh, initiative in itself. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, it, it, exactly. I think one of, the, one of the things that regulators, which is really good, frankly, are keen to do and to make sure that we we continue to have payment schemes that have the appropriate protection around them, which is absolutely mm -hmm. fundamental mm -hmm. obviously to any payment scheme, it goes without mm -hmm. saying. But I think now that we are no longer part of the EU, the opportunity for us to potentially develop maybe slightly more proportionate regulatory frameworks that are fit for purpose and yes. maybe don't have as many whistles and bells attached to them where they don't add value, I think is a, is a real opportunity. And I think it's good to see all of the regulators in the, the banking and payments industry keen to understand where some of those opportunities might be. For me, I think one of the biggest challenges that we we face, and we've certainly seen a ramping up of this over the past 12 months still, I'm afraid to say, is the is the challenges that we have in the UK around fraud. Yes, um, yes indeed. Which is not unique to the UK, but the certainly the way that the 
fast the payment scheme has been set up, it really does obviously lend itself to fraudsters exploiting that that scheme because the payments are immediate and uh, it's quite easy for that value to be extracted very, very quickly. If you can yes. dupe somebody into parting with their money through the scheme, it's very difficult to stop it and to get it back. So that in particular for us and for, for many others, I'm sure, is going to remain a big area of focus for us in 2023. Yes, indeed. Indeed. Um... I, I look at I look at the um, the original design specification of faster payments, and of course, the idea of removing friction almost completely was the goal, and we achieved that 17 years ago. It's amazing, and it's been oh, it's fantastic, been, been rock solid. It works pretty much every time, and now we find ourselves questioning whether, in fact, sometimes there's just not enough friction, and um, we don't really want to add friction because it diminishes the customer experience. But it's certainly uh, certainly is, is something that is being considered by the regulator in order to perhaps reduce the amount of authorised push payment fraud, as you say. Yeah, it is. I mean, I, I think we went into this as an industry, no, and a payments council back in the day as well, I'm sure, knowing that um, that this, this uh, system was going to be potentially susceptible to fraud. Um, and some of the controls that were built in at the time did, did help with that. But um, you know, faster payments doesn't have the degrees of protection that the card schemes, for example, have in place, where mm -hmm. they've been designed with you know fraud and and you know the, the like right at the heart of it from the outset. That wasn't really the case with faster payments, so mm -hmm. uh, I think the scheme does need to adapt, and we may need to actually introduce more friction, actually, to protect people, which unfortunately will mean payments might go slower in many instances, but that will lead to better outcomes if we can prevent customers being defrauded. It's not just about who picks the bill up. It's also just the, the frankly the inconvenience and the worry associated with people who've been defrauded. And it's just a terrible thing that we need to do much more to, to prevent. I would agree. I would agree. So so let's move on to something slightly um, that I know is close to your heart, which is um which is diversity. It's highly relevant. Uh, we've just um to our community, we've just launched a new stakeholder working group here called Project ESG. And uh, our members care a great deal about it. And 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 this project is here to help our industry to adopt um I think progressive strategies for how they impact the environment, our society, and our governance in a sustainable way. You know, I think it's a great, it's a great, a great vision. Um, yeah. and, you know, we're we're here to sort of affect some some change specifically about um, equity, equality, diversity, and inclusion, the talent base within the industry. What do you think of the vision, and 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 how should we prioritize moving up the the dial on diversity? Well, I mean, I, I'm I think it's a it's a fantastic thing to be announced, and congratulations, Tony, for having having taken the lead and, and really kind of take your stall out as to what you think that the industry as a whole should be aiming to achieve. I mean, for me, um, creating an inclusive working environment where anyone of any background with any protected characteristics or otherwise can, can thrive and give their best and, and succeed is really, really important. Um, and I think we've made great strides as an industry in, in many ways. Um, I mean, obviously, I think the, the original... Women in Finance Charter that Dame Jane Angardia um, sponsored and, and has promoted and has been a, an incredible success right across the industry, I think has made a big difference. And the principles underpinning that, I think, were the pretty basic. So firstly, you have to set a target. <laughs> Secondly, yeah. you have to publish how you're doing. And yeah. thirdly, you have to incentivize people in a very public way to deliver on the targets or otherwise. And if they don't, then people need to know about it. And yes. I mean, it's pretty basic stuff, but you know, the old adage of what gets measured gets done, I think is just as applicable to uh, aspects of a business like creating more diversity in the workforce than, than anything else. And, and I think it, you could do well and actually have a look at the, some of the work that the National Centre for Diversity have done. A, a colleague of mine, a friend of mine, Serlat Chowdhury, who runs that, had this, has this acronym called FREDI, which stands for, I'm see if I can get all six, um, fairness, respect, inclusion, equality, diversity, and engagement, I think oh. are the six characteristics of Freddie. And actually I've often uh, reflected on any organization I've worked in, whether um, whether we're really displaying those six characteristics, because those mm. are the things you really do need to create a properly inclusive workplace. And if you don't have an inclusive workplace, then you won't get diversity. Yes. People kind of talk about diversity and inclusion, but I've always, thought about it as inclusion and diversity because you need to start with inclusion you can't just start with trying to make things more diverse you have to think about what it is that 
your workplace is lacking that makes it less diverse than it could be and make it more inclusive and then that will come. I think that makes a great deal of sense. I like that inclusion first. I'm a bit worried, though, I must say, because we've done quite a bit of work here to try and encourage gender diversity as a community. Mm. Um, in fact, I don't think it's necessarily becoming a more gender diverse um, a market in terms of investment in fintech. Certainly, it looks as if women leading fintechs are now getting a smaller proportion of the pot than they used to. But, but to what extent does if, if we if we focus on diversity beyond gender, to what extent does does that diminish our chances of improve of solving the gender diversity problem? I I, th I think it, it's it's very easy to try and focus on one dimension or another, whether that's race or gender or any other um, characteristic. Uh, for me, as I say, I think you, you can, the, the trick should be to try and solve all of them at the same time. Mm. Um, and that is genuinely by, as I mentioned, you just want to try and create as inclusive workforce as you can. And if you have an inclusive working environment, then diversity will happen. Yes, I like It doesn't matter if that's gender or otherwise. I think part of the, I mean, part of the challenge in our, in our industry, and it's certainly been the case in banking as well, where we've had, if we just talk about the, the gender dimension first, um, you know, if there are fewer senior execs who are a female in the pool of talent in the industry, then you can't you can't magically create more. You yes. have to be able to. What you have to be able to do is you have to be able to create the environment where uh, junior execs from all you know walks of life can succeed and thrive. And last time I looked, fifty percent of the population were female, so there's absolutely no reason at all why. Um, junior female execs shouldn't be just as successful as junior male execs in the way that they progress and develop. So if you create the right environment to that, then there will be more female senior talent in time. And we're certainly seeing that happening. And, and we could do the same thing with race. We can do that with anything else that we want to. Yeah, very good. I like that. So kind of don't don't try and do one piece of the jigsaw, try and fill the jigsaw puzzle. I like that. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. But, but these are, this requires a fair bit of change, I think. And, and the subject I'd like to go on to talk a little bit about now is to do with um, to do with change management. And you've done your consulting piece. And one of the things consultants are often used to support is, is change, big, big organization changes. Um, we've had a fair few big change programs in our, our community recently, our industry. We've got the new payment architecture, open banking, uh, real-time growth settlement, you know, across Europe, it's uh, target two in the loads US. Yeah, yeah loads, loads of the acronyms. So what do you think, you know, you're running a business, you're sitting at the top of a business, or if you're an inverted pyramid leader, you're sitting at the bottom of a business with 19,000 people in it. What does it really take to facilitate change in our industry, do you think? And how well, how well are we doing? That's a really good question. And um, actually, you know, Tony, you've spoken about a number of examples of things that this industry has managed to deliver over the last, you know, or well, decades, frankly. And the, you know, looking back at faster payments 17 years ago now, that was an enormous investment um, mm -hmm. from across the industry where we all worked very closely together. We had a really clear vision of what we wanted to create, very clear end state of, of what that would look like and why it was valuable. And we just all got behind and and did it. And I think, frankly, that the same thing still applies today. I mean, when you, we spoke earlier, we mentioned earlier, but my brief foray into kind of food retailing when I came out of consulting. And actually, it's really interesting because in that industry, you never, ever, ever speak to your competitors. You just didn't ever do it because you didn't want ever to have anyone then be able to accuse you of colluding. Really? Um, uh, yeah, we're, but actually in our industry, it's really important that we collaborate mm -hmm. because of course. we're heavily regulated. We've got a huge amount of shared infrastructure. And actually, we need to work together as competitors. We need to work together to improve that infrastructure to make sure that it's fit for purpose so we can deliver what our customers expect of us. Yes. And frankly, I think with any change, you just need to have a single-minded vision of exactly what the benefits will be for customers at the end of the day mm. and then you need to you need to you know as with all leadership you have to sell that vision to others you have to create some shared ownership of that and then you have to commit people to get on and and doing it and i think part of the challenge maybe um with some of the things that we've tried to do recently is we've we've spent a lot of time on design and then we spent a lot of time trying to galvanize change and by the time we get to build it, then actually we maybe reconsider whether that's still fit for purpose because the world's moved on in yes. the three or four years it's taken us to get yes. to that point. And actually then you think, well, maybe we should put our foot on the ball and have another think about it. We never actually make the progress. And so I think what's definitely the case nowadays compared to uh, maybe 
well, five or six or even more years ago, is I think these really massive projects that we did a few years ago um, are harder to do these days. And what's easier is actually doing smaller things faster. Um, so maybe rather than trying to solve world hunger overnight, maybe we should be trying to just bite off a, a small piece of improvement, really being clear on what that would do, get behind yeah. it, deliver it, move on to the next one. I think I think those responsible for the big change programmes would welcome a chance to do that. There's sometimes I look at open banking, which is now five years old. Yeah. We've, done, we've had two and a half to three years of excellent progress in building and a couple of years of treading water. And even now, while we I respect enormously the integrity and and belief behind the team at the Joint Regulatory Oversight Committee, I think they have their work cut out, partly because there's a whole lot of new things coming in that are suggesting that either the problem they're trying to solve isn't as big a deal anymore, or that there's other solutions that they haven't factored in. And, and you you kind of, because everything is in, I hate the word interoperability, but you know, the word, because everything plugs into everything else in this industry, yeah. you kind of, it's hard to kind of transform one bit without reflecting the other changes taking place. I, I, I exactly think that is right. But one of the beauty of interoperability is you, you can almost kind of perform open heart surgery on one bit of it because of the interoperability that to, to an extent you can mm. you can try and isolate that from other things that's true that's true and i think just on in terms of banking i think the one of the things i mentioned right at the beginning of this discussion just now is around just making sure that we really understand what what's in it for the customer what are we actually trying to solve for the customer Mm. as opposed to what is the technology we're trying to put in or what is it that we're trying to create technically and I think sometimes maybe we lose sight of that and if you force yourself regularly to think about well are we actually still trying to be really customer focused in the solutions that we're trying to deliver then I think that North Star will really help pull things forward and maybe we've lost our way a bit with this. Very insightful. Thank you. So we've got a couple of a uh, couple of other areas I'd like to talk on, touch on. One is the economy. Um, you know, we're in a difficult position. You mentioned it earlier. Mm. Um, people seem a bit nervous. Um, we don't want to be tipping into a recession. What do you think is likely to be the appetite for investors in this sort of backdrop? And um, what do you think fintech should do to ride the storm? Yeah, I mean, it's a very it's a very challenging time for for you know investors in particularly in small businesses and for small businesses themselves in this investment climate because obviously over the past twelve months we've seen. Uh, costs of borrowing rise very materially. And so, uh, whereas previously the, the game might have been, you know, set up a business, grow customer numbers, try not to burn too much cash, stay around for three years, grow more customer numbers and flip it to the mm. next investor who, who likes the growth story. Unfortunately, that's much harder to do in a world where borrowing costs are higher. Yeah. And actually you need to generate returns quicker. Yeah. Uh, so I suppose if I were working in one of those firms, I'd be certainly thinking about um, my route to profitability and demonstrating that faster. I'd be even more acutely aware of cash burn mm. than, than I always was. And obviously for businesses, cash burn is the most important thing anyway. So that mm. wouldn't come as any surprise. Mm. Um, but it's going to be it's going to be a tough, maybe tough couple of years, maybe tough few years. Maybe this is the new normal, actually. And, and bank rate won't be back where it was and borrowing rates might well be higher for for a material amount of time. And then these models change and you just need to be you know, thinking very differently about how you grow and scale businesses. And then we have to do what the government wants us to do, which is be agile. And agile is good. I've been with market. Well, there you go. Yeah. That's it. And, and to be fair, this is this is one of the differences between what fintechs and new startups and large incumbents can do. I mean, large incumbents, unfortunately, speaking as a large incumbent myself, uh, yes, we can be agile around the edges, but We've got a very big machine that that lumbers on, and it's very difficult and very expensive to change it. So actually, we can innovate and and be agile around the, around the edges. But a lot of the stuff that we do day to day now, we'll still be doing day to day in a number of years' time. We'll probably be doing it in a very similar way because it takes a very long time to change. Yes, yeah, but you'll be doing it for a lot of customers with a lot of. You were absolutely customers. right, and and you know, scale payments is a really good example and I, I i definitely don't underestimate the value that that provides to customers and the importance of that you know real resilient reliable ongoing payments infrastructure that your members are supporting it's absolutely critical brilliant thank you so finally our last subject is um are you have you have family yes 
So imagine you're chatting to them or some of their friends, perhaps, and, um, you know, they're thinking about a career in business. You know, what advice, what would advice you, would you give a, a new graduate who approached you to say, Mike, I'm thinking of following in your footsteps. Um, you know, what are the things that I need to do? What would your top tips be? And so I'll tell you what, it's a really interesting question that my father was um, an oil economist and he kind mm. of first started out in the industry, the oil industry, when the oil industry was the big thing, right? Everyone wants to be an oil because it was where yes. all the money was being made. And now these days, not so much, right? Um, and it was probably the same thing for banking 20 years ago. You know, it was the thing. Everyone wants to be in banking. And now no one wants to be in banking. They want to be in fintechs. And they want to be doing, you know, medicine and biotech and all sorts of other cool yes. things that are that are happening. I think probably the, the advice I would give anyone starting out in their career is, just do something that you're passionate about because mm -hmm. you'll spend an awful lot of your waking hours doing the job that you'll end up doing and, and the career that you end up pursuing. So just make sure that what you do is something that you actually enjoy uh, because if you don't enjoy it, you're not going to be able to give your all. And if you haven't got that passion, that real passion around what you're doing and why you're doing it, then you won't enjoy it. And that's, that's just going to lead to a miserable life. So that's the most important thing. And probably one other thing I would say is just remember um, that your career is a marathon, not a sprint. And actually, for a lot of people, unless you're very lucky and extremely talented and you you find the new thing which you can scale up and sell in your teens or early 20s, which will probably only happen to a very small number of people. Very small. Um, number. Yeah, exactly. Good for them. Um, actually, you need to, you just need to remember that your the skills that you learn will change every day, you'll be developing every day, force yourself to think about what you're learning and how you can then apply that. And force yourself to think about, well, am I really enjoying what I'm doing? And if I'm not, you know, why don't I go and try and do something else? And I just think just taking that long term view is so important. Mm, yes. Well, I've loved that advice. Um, and I wish I had somebody saying that to me when I was just coming out of university. I've I've, I've had the privilege of interviewing a very passionate person. I'm so delighted that you've shared your insights with the community. So on behalf of all of us, Mike Rainier, CEO of Sandra Day UK, thank you very much indeed. Pleasure. Thank you.